On May 22nd, 1960, off the coast of Valdivia, Chile, residents experienced the strongest earthquake in recorded history. With a staggering magnitude of 9.5, this earth-shattering behemoth left over 1,600 people dead and 2 million displaced. But the devastation didn't stop there. A massive tsunami raced across the ocean for miles, tearing through the shores of New Zealand, Australia, Hawaii, and Japan. Now, nearly 70 years later, scientists believe that we are inching perilously close to an even greater threat, and they're calling it the big one. You're kidding, right? The Cascadia fault line stretching from California to Canada's Vancouver Island is a ticking time bomb with potential for massive devastation. According to seismologist Chris Goldfinger, the odds of a Cascadia megaquake happening in the next 50 years is one in three. If that happens, it will be like witnessing the real life equivalent of a kid's tantrum on a Lego set. Buildings collapsing, tsunamis up to 20 feet high, landslides destroying entire communities, and a humanitarian crisis that could last over a decade. What clues have we found that the Cascadia megaquake has happened in the past? How are cities like Vancouver preparing for this disaster? And how much time would West Coasters have to evacuate? A megaquake sounds a little dramatic, but it's more than a flashy name. It signifies the level of destruction these earthquakes can unleash. But what could cause Earth's tectonic plates to snap so violently? Well, the answer lies in the aptly named geological hotspot called the Ring of Fire. Seismologists, scientists who study earthquakes, have found a large area in the Pacific Ocean where several tectonic plates meet and slide underneath each other, creating zones of intense geological activity near the surrounding continents. Most of Earth's volcanoes are within the ring, hence its name. And about 90% of the world's earthquakes occur here, including the worst kind, megaquakes. Megaquakes, or megathrust earthquakes, happen at convergent plate boundaries. This is where two tectonic plates meet, and one begins to slide under the other. At a point, the descending plate is stuck due to displacement, building friction and pressure. Once it budges, we get a megaquake. This process is called subduction. Picture yourself trying to pull up a stubborn zipper on a hoodie. You struggle, tugging at it with all your might. Finally, the zipper shoots up, only to smack you in the chin. That's what this earthquake is like. Only this time, the zipper is the tectonic plates shifting below, and instead of a mere inconvenience, the result is the worst possible earthquake in history. This brings us to the Cascadia subduction zone, which lies off North America's west coast, spanning from California up to Vancouver Island, over 600 miles long. But the devastation would affect more than just the west coast of North America. A megaquake like this could create one of the largest tsunamis the world has ever seen. We're talking anywhere between 20 to 100 feet high. And these waves could travel for hundreds of miles to other parts of the world. But we'll plunge into more about that later. So why is it considered a ticking time bomb that scientists are calling the big one? Unlike more active regions, Cascadia has stayed eerily quiet for too long. We're talking 300 plus years. In that time, it's been steadily building pressure beneath the surface. Experts believe that when Cascadia finally does shift, the resulting megaquake could reach a magnitude of nine or higher, quite possibly far surpassing the strongest earthquake ever recorded in Chile that we mentioned earlier. So what happened during the era when the Cascadia wasn't quiet? To find out, let's go back to January 26th, 1700, the last time historians believed there was a megaquake along the Cascadia fault line. In the Pacific Northwest, the Koichan tribes spoke of a legendary battle between Thunderbird and Whale, two deities depicted in their artwork and totem poles. Other tribes on Vancouver Island have their own folklore surrounding a great event that disrupted the island's soil, wiped out entire villages, and altered the landscape forever. Over 4,000 miles away, Japanese records describe a massive tsunami around the same time. 
Researchers believe these towering waves were 75 feet high. Seismologists managed to connect the evidence back to a single, powerful origin, Cascadia. They came to an unsettling conclusion that earthquakes along the Cascadia fault line are bound to happen every 246 years on average. That means we are due for Cascadia's next megaquake in the next few decades, or within the next few minutes. Ugh. Just a tremor. In fact, geologists estimate that there have been 40 major earthquakes in the Cascadia subduction zone over the last 10,000 years. And now we arrive at today. If we know this threat is coming, what can we do to prepare? If you're enjoying the show and want to survive all the dangers life throws at you, make sure to like and subscribe. And let us know what you would do in this scenario in the comments below. Sorry guys, only room for one person in this bunker. The big one isn't just a one-time task. It's a continuous process of planning, learning, and preparing. Get your hands on useful resources as every step could make a difference. Thanks to advances in earthquake technology, we have the Shake Alert, a tool designed to detect early tremors of an earthquake and send alerts to those in the affected area to brace for impact or evacuate. Well, it will not prevent an earthquake. It is nice to have a little heads up before things start to literally go down. These crucial seconds can make all the difference as folks get more time to take cover, businesses can shut down operations, and cities can coordinate protocols for the incoming destruction. Take Vancouver, for example. With a population of nearly 700,000 within the city, it's a high-risk zone for a catastrophe. In response to a potential megaquake, the city has been working to reinforce dated infrastructure and train emergency response teams to limit casualties. If you ever go sightseeing there, you might notice some buildings with specialized shock absorbers and cross-bracing structures. These enhancements reduce swaying during a quake. The city also has some emergency routes designed with evacuations in mind. So what can you do to prepare? To secure your home, start by anchoring heavy furniture, water heaters, and propane tanks to prevent them from tipping over. This small act might be a potential lifesaver. You'll want to prepare a grab-and-go kit along with a home emergency kit. These will be essential during the quake and its aftermath. Aim to store at least one gallon of water per person per day. This should be enough for two to four weeks, and you should have a similar amount of non-perishable food available. Assemble a basic first aid kit. If possible, secure an additional one to three months supply of necessary medications. Without power, consider alternative methods of collecting information, like an NOAA weather radio. Keep extra cell phones charged and have a landline phone as a backup. In the absence of basic services, Sanitation systems like portable chemical toilets can come in handy. Practice living off emergency supplies for a weekend. This will help you identify gaps and mentally prepare for new challenges that arise. You might want to consider connecting with your neighbors to share resources and skills. Engage with your community emergency response team and take first aid classes along with CPR training. With this, you'll ensure that people are there for one another when it matters most. Sadly though, that's just the first chapter of a long road to recovery. It's a normal day along the Pacific Northwest coast when suddenly a faint yet unmistakable vibration begins to pulse through the ground. These initial tremors, better known as compressional waves or P waves, are the first indicators of a massive earthquake brewing. Compressional waves move faster than other seismic waves, creating a push and pull effect on the ground in a back and forth motion. Something funny going on there. Systems like the Shake Alert catch these P waves, sending advanced notice moments before the main shock hits, creating a window of opportunity to take cover. You might notice birds flying away in droves, and dogs across the affected area may start barking. Animals have sensitive hearing, and some can pick up on P waves before humans notice. Their agitation serves as an eerie, crucial warning as the quake's energy begins to surge and ripple through the terrain. Then comes the surface waves, the real stuff you need to worry about. Unlike P waves, surface waves are much slower and pack a devastating punch. They are a formidable force of nature that move in a rolling motion, lifting and shifting the ground. 
The violent shaking in this scenario would likely knock down transformers and power lines. Without electricity, homes and businesses will need to rely on emergency lighting, if any, to navigate the impending catastrophe. I hope you packed a flashlight and plenty of batteries in your go bag. Everything left unsecured inside buildings, such as bookshelves, lamps, and computers, will be sent flying, turning rooms into a deadly hailstorm of falling debris. Gas lines could erupt, sparking fires that would be impossible to control given the damage to infrastructure. Older buildings, especially those constructed before seismic codes in the 1970s, will be the first to collapse. FEMA estimates around 1 million structures will either collapse or be severely compromised. That includes schools, highway bridges, and two-thirds of the railways and airports in the area. Essential services would be hit especially hard. 618,000 buildings, 2,000 schools, and 100 hospitals are expected to suffer moderate to complete damage according to a 2022 report by FEMA. As if that weren't enough, thousands of landslides would follow. Oregon projects over 10,000 fatalities in the region with millions in need of shelter and supplies. Emergency services would be pushed beyond the brink, with shelter needed for over 1 million displaced people, plus food and water for another 2.5 million. By now, you know it doesn't end here. Earthquakes cause tsunamis. Yeah. The Pacific Northwest is only the nexus for this intercontinental event. Large earthquakes trigger tsunamis that travel vast distances across oceans, affecting regions thousands of miles away. Even countries outside the Ring of Fire aren't safe from tsunamis. The 2004 Boxing Day tsunami reached over 1,800 miles from Indonesia all the way to East Africa. A megathrust earthquake off the Cascadia subduction zone will create monstrous waves that could race across entire oceans. Residents along the Pacific coast will be the first to face the mega tsunami. This colossal wave triggered by the earthquake's force would barrel towards the shore with destructive energy. One that threatens to obliterate everything in its path. Emergency protocols along the coast are designed for rapid evacuation. When a significant quake hits, residents in coastal communities are trained to immediately head for higher ground. Depending on your location, find out if there's a tsunami evacuation tower close by and plan a day to figure out a fast route to its location. These evacuation plans focus on getting people out of what's known as the inundation zone, low-lying coastal areas most vulnerable to flooding. Insights from The New Yorker warn that the inundation zone will likely be scoured of structures from California to Canada, so expect buildings, roads, and landmarks to be wiped away by the force of the tsunami. For those in this zone, the warning message is stark. When that tsunami is coming, you run, says Jay Wilson, chair of the Oregon Seismic Safety Policy Advisory Commission, also known as OSPAC. While movies often depict tsunamis as singular, towering waves, the reality is actually worse. It will be the whole ocean elevated overtaking land. As it surges inland, it will carry an immense amount of debris. Boats, cars, cinder blocks, and anything else in its path. Even Lieutenant Dan will have a hard time making it through this storm. Survival tips are crucial and straightforward. If you're near the coast when the quake hits, drop to the ground, take cover under something sturdy, and hold on tight. Run to higher ground immediately after the quake, but be wary of the aftershock period. This is when smaller quakes can occur. Don't wait for official alerts if you're in a tsunami-prone area. Act fast. Have an evacuation routine memorized and use it to get out of the inundation zone quickly. Surviving is a start, but the hardest part will come afterwards, with the painstaking task of rebuilding and rescuing survivors. As for the rest of the world, the waves of the tsunami would rush further west and likely devastate the shorelines of Japan first. We could see destruction on a similar scale to the Tohoku earthquake of 2011. With millions struggling, people will resort to desperate measures. Emergency officials have prepared estimates for what post-quake recovery might look like, and the timeline is daunting. OSPAC estimates it could take well over a year before basic infrastructure is fully restored. For survivors, the first hurdle would be access to clean drinking water and food. In addition to non-perishable foods, residents may need to find community relief resources. This will be especially tough given the expected damage to roads. 
Purify water with filters, tablets, or by boiling it. Store as much potable water as possible before the disaster. And secure emergency medical kits to treat injuries. Looking at recent disasters helped paint a realistic picture of what's ahead. After the 2011 Fukushima earthquake and tsunami, parts of Japan are still uninhabitable due to radiation from a nuclear power plant destroyed by the tsunami. In Chile, the 2010 earthquake left parts of the country dealing with repairs that spanned nearly a decade. Recovery from this catastrophe could follow a similar trajectory, with decades spent rebuilding. Survivors will face both physical and emotional challenges, with long-term effects on communities. It will be crucial to find resilience in the face of this unimaginable hardship. The Cascadia Megathrust earthquake isn't a matter of if, but when. For anyone living near the fault line, it is critical to start preparing now. Keep gloves, a pair of sturdy shoes, and a trusty flashlight within easy reach to help you navigate safely through the debris after a quake. Understanding and integrating earthquake safety into your lifestyle could be the difference between life and death. To better grasp what the big one could look like, check out our earthquake size comparison on another episode of How to Survive.